Good evening. I am your host tonight for Digital Demos. Uh, welcome to this Halloween edition of Digital Demos with some smooth jazz and moon landings. Uh, tonight we'll be going over uh, with Sal Armeta and Ryan. We will be going over, uh, sorry, Ryan McMahon. We'll be going over how to make your crabby model look awesome and how to make your awesome model not look crabby with good photography. Um, we'll be introducing you to the Heliodon, which is uh, actually part of this moonscape behind my head right now. Um, please feel free to join me in cheesy uh, Halloween getups. This is my uh, this is my best moon lander. So I'm going to be turning it over to Sal and Ryan, who are going to take us through about you know 20 minutes of some video and uh and how to set up the heliodon what it is what that fancy word is i just said um why it looks like that thing right there um but for the moment i can't resist so that's one small step for digital demos one giant leap for sal armada thank you guys take it away it was cheesy i had to do it Um, all right, well, thank you, Andrew, Andrew, for that amazing segue into this. Um, so this is Ryan, a fifth year architecture student who also has a minor in photography. Yep. Yeah, that stuff. Um, Ryan is one of the few people I know who actually tries to take really good pictures <laughs> of his mind. Like everyone tries to take like good pictures, but like Ryan usually puts more effort into it um, than many other people typically do. So we're gonna go over this big ass um, little thing. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this, which is the Heliodon, um, it's essentially a device for creating ac pretty accurate sun angles um, for your models, um, which is a great way to both understand the lighting in terms of sun studies, but also just get super nice lighting um, and create a pretty good aesthetic for all of your models and make them just knock them up an extra notch in terms of quality. Um, we'll also talk about a few um, general tips and tricks for just generally making good models. Hey, the lights went off. I'm gonna turn those back on. Uh, Ryan, you can get started. <laughs> All right, I don't know how much I can get started with. Uh, in, another, uh, in another two minutes, the sun will come back around the moon. <laughs> All right, well, just have to walk around every once in a while with all the motion sensors in here. Um, this is also in the C building. Um, this is the only building where you can use this. Um, yeah. And, Uh, general tips and tricks uh, for study models. Like you don't necessarily need to heal you down. You're just trying to take a quick something. Just fold up a piece of paper, turn it into like a little screen, put it one piece of paper under it. You got a nice little white background set up for yourself. Take some nice photos. Um, you don't need a DSLR or any kind of fancy camera to get nice fixed pictures, but if you have one, definitely helps. Um, but I always recommend having a tripod even for your phone camera or anything. Uh, you can find like a $10 uh, uh, phone tripod online. <clears throat> it's true. Plenty of those. <laughs> um, <clears throat> but yeah, so I always recommend that. It's always going to give you a much clearer image than if you're just holding them with your hand. Um, but sometimes getting to those like nuts and crazies you need to do, just take out your phone and get some nice perspective shots from inside the building. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, we're gonna get started with the Heliodon. So this is the Heliodon. It sets itself up so that you can. All right, so this is the Heliodon. Uh, down here, this handle will let you see uh, your long latitude. <laughs> 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 the angle of the sun. Yeah, yeah, the angle angle of the sun from wherever you are on Earth. So you can set it up to be either right above the equator. So, oh, God, it's heavy. 
And yeah, hopefully get those yeah. words. So right above, directly, straight up and down, or, you know, Antarctica, all the way down. But, um, <laughs> and then you can set it up with this to get you your month. So you have starting from, uh, where is it at? Yeah. From October right now. <laughs> January, yeah. February, yeah, all the way through December. Um, and as you do that, they go through the, like, six or seven rings on here. Uh, obviously, some of them overlap with each other because that's how the sun works. But yeah, so that's how you set that up. And then time of day, you just kind of move these around. So Ryan, each one of those, uh, each one of those represents the sun's path during one month of the year. Uh, yes. So if you set it up to the right location, uh, based on its like latitude, longitude. Um, <clears throat> you can have it go through each of the months and a day throughout that month. Awesome. So what month is turned on right now, just for example? Uh, this is at about 35 degrees and all the lights are also living. Yeah. Ah, so it's April and August. OK, yeah. so this would be the path of the sun. Can you guys just um, can you just do a shot of the model and take us from like, you know, sunrise through to sunset so we can get a feel of what that looks like? So you just kind of slide it with your hand. Oh wow! And you can make sun, you can make the sun rise. I don't know if you guys can hear this, but these wheels also sleep terribly. Um, <laughs> thankfully, thankfully, it's not so bad for us online. That's good. But it's nice to see the sun, how the sun would move across your project. It's also really nice because the the halogen light is really nice and bright. So it's got these really crisp shadows. Yeah. Beautiful pictures. And um, another tip is if you want to get like really professional photographs, you can have a diffuse light along in the room going on the opposite end of wherever the direct light is coming in. That'll give it a more like sunlight feel um, because there's a mixture of direct and diffuse light when the building is outside. Um, and you won't have such harsh shadows, but you'll still be able to see pretty good shadow uh, clarity. Um, can you guys, um, it, it's amazing to see like with the ambient light from the, cause we have both the cameras spotlighted now, you know, just like how the camera photographs it versus how it looks in the room. It's amazing the difference of how the phone just picks up those kind of the dark blacks of the shadows, the sharpness of the lights because those halogens are so bright. Yeah. Um, it also has to be with being like directly with the model. Um, being back here in the room, you don't have the light getting directly into the camera, so it's not uh, interfering with it. <clears throat> but it being there actually helps it, makes it a much more dramatic shot. You could use this for, I mean, you could use this for final photography. You could also use it as like a test bed for like a test for an iteration of a model, or even just to like design how big of a roof overhang you want. If you want to make sure you're getting like passive winter can you uh, can you switch the the year? Can you go to December? Can we do like uh, the winter solstice? Yep. I mean, I think faculty talk about this all the time, and I think we all know that we all know inherently that like the sun is lower in the sky in the winter time, but sometimes we don't realize how big of a difference it is. So that's December. Wow. Cool. Yeah. Stop. If you can, Ryan, can you stop it at noon and can you put it at noon in the summertime and just go back and forth between what June and what December is like? Because that's the such a big difference. Wow. It's like literally the difference between being like right overhead and being at like, well, 35 degrees, right? Yeah. <laughs> Awesome. I think 35 degrees would be towards the uh, equinox. So this That's is true. Probably, yeah. There you go. Yeah. Yeah. So 
this is, yeah, I don't know if there's much more to add to the general demonstration of the heliobound, but. On that, um, as Ryan mentioned, it's really helpful. Like, you don't need, you know, this fancy, probably somewhat expensive thing to take all your pictures. Uh, you can do it with your model. The nice benefit of that is I can um, just get like right into this model and uh, it's not go over there. Uh, but you know, um, you know, you can get a pretty good sense of the space. And I mean, like, you just take them apart and just put it in there. Yeah, and I think it's a good thing to take into account when starting to do photography of your models is, oh, we get it again. Yes. <laughs> um, know the shots that you wanna take of your model before you go in to take the shots. Um, you've been working with your project for who knows how long, an entire semester sometimes. So you know the angles where you want your project to be seen, you know the angles where it looks the best, you know the angles that encapsulate the entire concept. Um, so try and get what you are looking for, not just like take, oh, you know, like, oh. I might not really <laughs> want to take a picture of a model from straight down or from rather than like a nice dynamic angle. Um, it's kind of like doing a rendering as well in the way you kind of think about those angles. Um, now, this is also a very nicely built model, so it is also very photogenic. Um, <laughs> So if you have something like a study model that might be a little bit sloppier, <laughs> might have a few mistakes, you know, you might want to hide those. So for instance, on this model, uh, look at the bottom of it, you can see that whoever built it uh, decided this is going to leave a barcode on it, which <laughs> everyone knows that is something you should never do. Excuse me, it. that was a study model. <laughs> I think I just heard somebody get thrown under the bus. I, I think that's what that, I think that's what that that bump noise was. Anyway, um, so if you take a picture of it at a certain angle, it's actually you might not have really good angles for that man. But you know, you don't want to show that barcode. So obviously you'll have to pick your angles based on you know, wherever there is the least amount of loose stains or barcodes or anything. Because um, your camera will be really good at showing all of those mistakes and emphasizing them or really emphasizing all the clean aspects of the craft. Um, as a little, uh, Tangent, I once actually had a boss during an interview point out the glue stains on a picture of a model I had in my portfolio. Um, yeah, I, I mean, we did it very jokingly, but it was great because I didn't even see some of them. Always, always, if you have glue stains on your model that you can't get rid of, take them into Photoshop. <laughs> Just, you got to get rid of them. <laughs> Um, right there is actually a little shining spot from the glue. So depending on the lighting you have, it can go shown. Although this is also a fairly clean study model. So. Um, yeah, other than that, um, that's the Heliodon. Um, yeah, we can just go into like taking photos inside of a studio if you just want to like take some quick photos uh, without the heliodon. These three of these will make anything into a studio. <laughs> nice little map board, white map board, easy, or black even. Black the mobile, oh wow, it's, it's two-toned. Oh yeah, it's, it's versatile. <laughs> Insta Studio. Well, and I think that like a lot of people think like, well, I'll just use like my bed sheet, but then you end up like it bed sheets kind of look like wrinkly bed sheets. And so people are like, well, I'll get this nice white piece of foam core. Well, like, yeah, if you keep it like if you have a nice white piece of foam core, great. And then after it starts to get a little dingy, use it for a study model and replace it. That way you can get multiple uses out of it. The color of the piece, though, is also very important because, um, you know, a white background will reflect the light more, but a black one will also kind of absorb it more. Um, and depending on how you set up your lighting as well, you can actually get more hot spots, I found, on like black backgrounds. So you kind of have to be careful with those. Uh, but the white background also really helps with photoshopping everything out. 
because you have to do less lassoing. Having having a nice matte background, all one color helps with photoshopping up the background a lot. Makes your workflow for setting up your portfolio or anything ten times easier. Um, yeah. I think the, the other nice thing about those lights on the Heliodon is that they have a really nice kind of splash and then a nice fall off, which means that there's like, there's a really good amount of like, like hot light in kind of a center spot. And then it falls off pretty evenly. Whereas if you're taking a photograph with like fluorescent lights, you tend to get really uneven, very kind of harsh bluish light. These have kind of a nice warm kind of yellow white tone to them, which feels a lot more like sunlight, but gives these kind of warm tones to the photograph, which you can do in Photoshop, but it's one less step that you have to do if you start with a good photograph. Yeah, I think the worst thing that you can do in taking uh, a final photo of your model is to just say, I'm gonna use my phone and try and take some that way, because this just does not look at all like sunlight at all like it just it just doesn't have the same feel it's way too cool light um yeah i would say definitely find a nice halogen light or anything well, like your phone light might be nice as like a decent thin fill light um to kind of fill out the colors also like, you know, like a $5 construction lamp or like, like Home Depot and Lowe's have these like lamps with clamps on them that you can use. There's also like, I think a lot of us have like LED lights, um, either desk lamps or like side table lamps. LED lights have a nice consistent lighting um, as well that can work really well. And if you have a dimmer on it, then you can do even more fancy stuff. Um, whether you're bouncing the light off something or you're, or you're just lighting it directly. Um, Sal, you were talking about a fill light. You can also impart like a color rather than just doing it as a filter on your phone. You can impart colors to things by like bouncing light off of something that has a blue, green, or red hue and give a cast to your photograph. If it's embedded in the actual image because you lit it that way, it's a lot less work and you get this kind of special quality where your jurors are kind of like, what is going on there? It's kind of, it's kind of nice. Switch it up, keeps it different. Um, so Savannah just asked um, how we would um, manage the background when using this. Um, yeah. So that is something that can tend to be somewhat difficult. Um, typically when we do use this, we would usually push it into one of the classrooms um, where we can get a lot less light. And usually when it's pitch black, um, that's usually just the best way to really mitigate all of the shadows and reflections and stuff. Um, but obviously we can't do that right now because all the classrooms are locked at the moment. Um, and then beyond that, um, it would really just be, you could put a white sheet of like foam pour or mat board on this table. Um, that way you don't really have like all these scratches and there's like a stain right there, um, with whatever that is and stuff. Um, so you get a much cleaner surface that will also give you a little bit better bounce lighting throughout it. Um, and then you would just have to kind of like try and, if you angle your images well to like avoid anything annoying in the background, you won't have as many problems. Um, and you can always kind of freely rotate the model as you wish to get what you want. Um, although it does work best when you're kind of <laughs> centered on the thing and like facing north as it would be. The, the Heliodon's on wheels, so is it possible for you guys to rotate it, set up the background, and actually that's kind of, this is a nice shot. Uh, can you guys can you guys use those pieces of foam core and just show us what it would look like if they were like a black backdrop or a white backdrop, just to kind of see, show how you use it? Do you guys usually do photo photography with somebody else or do you do it by yourself or does it depend? Oh, I'm sorry, Ryan. You're just outside of the microphone's uh, listening range. Oh, sorry. Now I can hear. Uh, I usually take photos with the sound guys sometimes later, just because it's easier to like set up. Easier with a helper. Yeah. Uh, you can have someone standing behind it and just have the background for whatever purpose. Yeah. I think it's also. 
I think it's it's nice to have somebody just like hold something and make tiny adjustments rather than always having to feel like you have need to have three hands. And of course, the other thing is ha having a second set of eyes, I think helps take better photography too. It makes it less boring, uh, it adds some fun, but also I think it, it adds a second. No, but if you actually slide it, um, like if you actually slide it in between. Oh um, yeah. Just to not block the sun. Um, this way, you can actually. Wow. Yeah. And then, we'll only have a slight tail, but at the very least, the main thing you really want um, when you are using the backdrop is as long as it's white behind the model. Um, so, if I were to angle like this, the majority of that is white, so it'll still be a much easier time to Photoshop much of the background out. <clears throat> You also got to be careful because uh, this cable kind of uh, rotates on the side. <laughs> <clears throat> I recommend taking time taking your photographs because it saves time later. It saves time having to edit things out, Photoshop, um, and just, you know, all around the workflow is much faster. Also, in terms of backgrounds, um, usually if you want a super clean background, it's better to just kind of like set up sort of like a full like mini studio of sorts. It's just like white pieces of material. Um, the Heliodon does have like a nice aspect that even if you do have like the table or the rings showing, it kind of still gives it like a kind of nice aesthetic to it in a way. Because um, at least like, you know, you look at it and you know, you'll be like you have Andrew's background on the Moonlander. <laughs> I mean, uh, I will say, yeah, like this background, this very background is taken from a, a freshman's um, model. Props, shout out to Viv. Um, she had this kind of awesome like paper mache model. And the problem um, that I hope, I hope Viv's okay with this. Like it very much looked like newspaper paper mache, but when we put it underneath the Heliodon and lit it up with these shadows and then just kind of, adjusted the lighting and the shadows a little bit more to be a little bit louder it just transformed into this like moonscape and i keep this has been my zoom background for actually all of my viz classes now because it's just like this awesome weird landscape and i i kind of love the fact that if you know that this is our heliodon the machine that you guys are operating you kind of know that's what those rib cages are but if you don't it kind of feels like it's some kind of weird spaceship satellite thing and i, I love it it just, it shows the process. And I don't think there's any professor that anybody could present to where they wouldn't love the fact that it actually shows that you are using the Heliodon, that you're using the tools at school to help your learning. I mean, there's no way that somebody's gonna be grumpy and be like, you know what? This would be a lot better if you took a picture of the Heliodon out of it. Like, no way, no way. I, I will give you a slice of pizza if you find a faculty member that's grumpy that you're using the Heliodon. Cool. Um, th where is, can you guys go over where this mechanism is located again? And like, if you need training or to sign it out or anything? Um, so there's no training required for it. Um, it's just a simple, you know, don't break it. Um, it is fairly straightforward to use. It's only got, you know, a few knobs and buttons on it. Um, and it is located in the seat building, which is all the way in the back of campus, um, right? Uh, behind the gym and behind like the townhouses. Yeah. Between the tennis courts. Yep. Sorry, Ryan. I was just saying near the tennis courts by the townhouse. Yeah. And it's it's literally, it's like, it, I wouldn't say that it's free to use. I, I would say that like, if you're a student at CABE, you have already paid for this thing to be available and you can come in and use it anytime the building is open. Um, and you can get the building opened up even now during COVID, if you have a buddy, you can get the building open during operating hours and, and use this. It's it's very easy to be clean. Uh, it's very easy to be socially distant. Um, there's actually a huge cord. Can you just, um, Ryan, can you pick up the cord and just show how it's kind of connected on a big, long? Yeah, so you can even operate that with plenty of distance between you, <laughs> with like plenty of distance. And if you have questions, you know, it's, 
there's usually people that are around in seed that can kind of show you, but it's really easy to figure out how to use and it immediately takes better pictures, just way better pictures. When did you guys first start using it? And when did you, when, it, when did you decide this was an awesome thing to use? Uh, we, I first used it second year um, after our first grow home project. I think the first time I used it was second or uh, first year during the uh, case study, the design part of the case study project. Um, nice. I think it's one of those tools where like if you, you need to, it, it really helps if you know somebody that's used it. But of course, right now that's a little tough to get introduced to. So I think, you know, having something like this is really handy because it's it's not a scary machine. It looks weird, but it's not a scary machine. Um, yeah. Hey, could you guys demonstrate just how it like, sometimes it's usually like all closed and locked up. Can you guys just demonstrate what those devices are? Cause it, you know, people might not see it in this status. Yeah. Is that possible? Um, sure. I mean, yeah. Thanks, guys. So I'm just going to narrate as uh, Sal and, and Ryan are working on this. So normally, you know, it needs to be designed so that it'll fit through a standard doorway. And so there's a couple of latches that actually lock the tabletop into place, but it can rotate up vertically like that. And then there's another latch that secures it in place. There's a little like um, gas arm that keeps it in place. And then there's a safety latch to keep it locked. And then that same knob that you can just gently rotate um, to rotate into different places, that allows you to take it completely vertically. And then you can unplug it, unlock the wheels, and you can move it in seed. It has to stay in the seed building, but you can move it wherever you need to take it. And that's why they're saying normally people take it into, you can sign out the conference room and you can wheel it into the conference room as long as you put the conference room back together when you're done. But the nice thing is that's an entirely internal room. And so that allows you to be in a really highly controlled environment. But you can also use the Heliodon in the ambient light of what's, uh, what's around um, just in the seed center itself because the seed center has those awesome skylights. Thanks guys. It's like, it's really usable. Oh, sorry, Sal. We uh, we can't hear you unless you're pointed at unless you talk to the laptop. Um, it's typically sitting right in front of that window over there when you're going to Yes, the right, right where Ryan's standing is usually where it's parked. That's kind of sometimes there's a model on it for demonstration purposes, or somebody forgot their model. Generally, you just park that on one of those tables. Very cool. <clears throat> Can we ask you? I was just wondering if we could ask you guys some questions. If you guys could sit down in front of the laptop and we could just ask you guys some questions. Sure. Nice. You know. uh, Ryan, why is your video like reversed? It's mirrored. Yeah. <laughs> so, so what are the, like, what do you guys usually take photographs with do you take them with like really nice camera or what are you guys what are you guys photographing with most of the time i always use my phone um it's just a simple samsung smartphone okay what's the i mean when you're taking a picture like do you just kind of like turn on the camera and start taking snapshots do you set up a background for yourself do you hold up a piece of paper um i usually try to have a white background behind it um, sometimes depending on the angles I'm trying to get, I kind of just like go in to it. Cause if it's like, I'm trying to get pictures of the interior then I don't really care too much for the backdrop is cause the backdrop is going to be probably like cardboard or something. Um, and other than that, I typically try to set the camera to, um, the camera's pro mode. Um, that way I at least have a little bit more control and I don't have autofocus or auto exposure kind of messing around with things on me. Gotcha. So uh, Ryan, you have taken some photography courses. Is Did that spring from an interest in shooting your models or just a general interest in photography? I think they kind of worked hand in hand. Like I only picked up my interest in photography once I got here. Um, and I think that was partially like the people that I was hanging around, but they were also in architecture taking good pictures of their models. Um, so 
it kind of worked hand in hand. Um, but yeah, now I've got my camera that I use for my models. And so that's what my next question was. That's like a really, that's a super fancy camera. Do you, do you take those pictures? Do you take pictures with that one all the time? Or do you like go back and forth between your phone and that one? Or um, if I'm trying to take like a quick, like study model photo for like class the next day or something like that, it's usually just going to be with my phone uh, just because I can easily send that to myself uh, without having to, you know, get my SD card and my laptop all together. And, um, <clears throat> but uh, if I'm trying to take like, you know, my end of the semester end of project pictures, I'm going to, you know, set up the whole thing. Gotcha. Um, Sometimes, you know, while Ryan takes those pictures, I have him take my pictures too. So, you know, if you have a friend nice. with a fancy camera, it's good to, you know, <laughs> take advantage of that. Nice. Nice. So like, um, do you do that like after critique? Do you do that before critique? So you're using the you're using the photographs in your in your final pinup, or when do you when do you usually try to take photos? It really depends on the project for me. Um, usually it's after. I will say yeah. that there it's after when there's time to take good ones. Um, also, it sometimes is a matter of how quickly do I think my model is going to fall apart after crit. Um, so. And also, how well did my model come together? That's, that's right. I mean, I think one of the important points that you said, which is that like you can actually hide like the model, especially right now when we're presenting everything digitally, you can you'd only have to show the angles where your model is doing what you want it to do. It's it's just a fact of the circumstances that we're in. So you might as well carefully utilize that. How much time do you usually spend like cleaning up a photograph? Like if you want to use it in a crit versus if you're like taking pictures afterwards to put it in a portfolio, you might take longer. How much do you guys think that you take? For a portfolio um, is definitely much, much longer than I would for a crit. Sure. Um, simply because, you know, a crit's just kind of like a one-time thing. And even if someone doesn't like the picture, like I'm not that concerned with it. Um, it's not like, you know, I'm critting in front of potential bosses. Gotcha. Um, other than that, I'd say I probably wouldn't spend for a crit. I probably wouldn't try to spend like more than like a couple of hours editing that picture for it. Um, but for a portfolio, I'd probably willingly spend like an entire day editing gotcha. photographs if I wanted to get them to be like really nice. And I mean, I just want to point out another thing that you guys were saying while you were working on taking photographs is if you just take a few moments while you're taking the photograph to control the background and the lighting, that saves like. 10 minutes, 20 minutes, a half an hour of doing Photoshop on the back end. Um, Cause you could just do it in the, in the camera. Do you guys do editing in your camera phone at all? Or do you do most of your editing in Photoshop? All in Photoshop. All okay. In Photoshop. Yeah. All right. All right. Um, and then when you do process photographs, I mean, I, I gotta believe that that goes faster, but why would you take pictures of your process? Are you including that in your portfolio? Does it go in your presentations? Uh, it can. I mean, yeah, uh, especially right now with Zoom, you know, process, showing your process to your professor is, you know, the only way you can do it is usually through a photograph right now. Um, Wait, you mean professors care about that stuff? <laughs> yes. We like those process pictures. <laughs> oh my God. I thought we just wanted the final stuff where the architecture looks right. <laughs> No, I'm, um, I'm, yeah. I'm kidding to everybody. If you don't know that I'm kidding, I am I'm telling you, I'm telling you right now, I am kidding so much. I love process. Sorry, just wanted to be on record with that. <laughs> um, yeah, I had a student that took a picture of their desk like every day and presented a grid of those. And I was just like, that's amazing. That's an amazing drawing right there. They're like, it's not a drawing, it's photographs. I was like, yeah, but every single day it's a time-lapse drawing of how you went about this process. Like that takes a lot of effort. Like that was awesome. Yeah, that's cool. What, what's like, what's your favorite weird trick to do with photographs that you do to put your flavor on stuff? Hmm. Hmm. I usually just play around with like the lighting a lot. Um, sometimes I try to get like interesting lens flares on it. Um, I'll typically just take a picture and I'll just throw it into Photoshop and then I'll like readjust like the angles of it and stuff and start like distorting the image. Um, and sometimes I might like change like the color balance on it as well. Um, that's usually kind of what I do with it. 
I always try to get a deep focus. So I try to get my camera phone to focus on something in the foreground and then it gets blurrier towards the background. That's what's happening with the image over my shoulder. So like right here is in focus and then in the background is out of focus. That deep focus is always like really gives it a sense of like being much larger scale than it is. That's what I try to do, which usually means like screwing with my camera. So I take the picture while it's trying to focus, which means I get about five bad pictures for one good picture, but they're easy to delete while you're like eating dinner. So. Ryan, how about you? What do you, uh, what weird, what weirdness do you do? Um, because I have the nice camera, I can play with things like exposure and, uh, uh, you know, the uh, f stops and things like that. Um, <clears throat> so one of the like the things that I like to do is long exposure, low light shots, mm. uh, and play with the light as the exposure is going through. Wow. So that there's changing light happening as you take the shot. Oh, you're like artsy or something. <laughs> yeah. Well, so it sounds like also like, you know, like having a plan is important, but also like playing around and exploring is important too. And I don't know, it seems like the professor in the room likes it when people do that. So you probably get bonus points for showing that off. Um, you know, normally when you're pinning up, you have a limited amount of pinup space. My students have a pinup on Tuesday. They have an unlimited amount of slides. They can use as many as they want just a limited amount of time. So um, any questions from all of the people that are uh, that are in the room? Anybody want to type or ask anything? I was going to say, uh, we threw somebody under the bus earlier. I don't know whether they wanted to like ask any like hard hitting questions <laughs> to the duo here. I'm going to take the silence as a no. Um, all right, I'm gonna turn off the recording. I'm gonna say thank you to we're gonna we're gonna hang out for a little bit more questions and uh, smooth jazz. But uh, thank you for joining us tonight on Digital Demos. This has been a special presentation with Ryan McMahon and Sal Meta. I'm Andrew Hart, your Digital Demos host. As you slide off into the night this evening, have a happy Halloween and excellent Digital Demos.